Welcome everyone to iAfrica Media, the biggest media platform for all things IK on the African continent. I'm Obi Malopi, an optometrist based here in South Africa, the motherland. And of course, today we are with one of the most incredible human beings that you'll get to discover why I say that very shortly. And that is, of course, Dr. Nasir Ali. How are you today, Doc? I'm good and you, Obi. I'm very, very excited to finally have this opportunity to sit across you and we talk all things eye care, all things ophthalmology. Uh, yeah, Dr. Ali, uh, firstly, thank you so much for your support for iAfrica Media. Um, when we started iAfrica Media with Dr. Dawa Glover, Dr. Imani Tarib, one of the things that we were most passionate about was bridging the gap between ophthalmology, optometry, as well as the optical dispensers throughout the continents of Africa. And immediately when we started showcasing some of the earlier work that we were doing, you are one of those early adopters that started commenting, started celebrating the work. And we are very grateful for ophthalmologists or ophthalmology leaders like yourself who see the vision, who see the need for all of us to be one in being big advocates for IK excellence. Because at the end of the day, our patients are the ones that are going to benefit the most when all the different components of IK come together. So I just want to thank you on behalf of iAfrica Media for that, because if you are doing that, you are going to be influencing so many other people, especially those ophthalmologists who are going to come after you to be able to have that same energy, same passion. But enough about that. Um, who is Dr. Ali? Sure. So <laughs> <laughs> my name is Nasir Ali. Um, I'm an ophthalmologist. Uh, consultant at St. John Eye Hospital here in Soweto, okay. uh, South Africa. My subspecialties of interest include um, vitreoretinal surgery, which okay. is my uh, primary love, so to say. And then here at St. John's as a consultant, you uh, can't just do one subspec because of um, staffing constraints. So we all do two subspecialties, and I do pediatrics in addition to retinal. On that note, we've got audience members from different parts of the continent, as well as outside of Africa. The St. John, for people in South Africa, when you just say St. John Eye Hospital, we already know the, 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 the value it contributes to the community here in Soweto and the, the larger community in Gauteng. What is St. John's Eye Hospital? Because immediately when you say, you cannot just be focused on one speciality or subspeciality. Can you just give our audience members a breakdown of actually what is in John Eye Hospital and why is it so well known within the IK community at large? So uh, first, let me just correct something. Um, St. John's doesn't just see patients from Gauteng. Okay. We see patients from other provinces wow. and Southern Africa. Wow. So a lot of our patients travel from other countries, uh, Malawi, Zimbabwe, etc., to come and receive their eye care here. Wow. And sometimes, I think probably because it's called St. John Eye Hospital, they, um, the name resonates with eye care. But um, there are closer eye hospitals, and sometimes we do wonder, like you could travel a short distance <laughs> and get your care, and you know. Um, but I guess. Um, patients associated with um, having eye care. So St. John Eye Hospital is the largest uh, eye hospital in the country. Um, in terms of our patient load, in terms of uh, the training that uh, registrars undergo here, etc., we the largest in everything. Okay. We also um, strive for excellence for our patients, uh, which is quite difficult considering sometimes the, the patient load that we have. But uh, obviously we are doing our best and we offer all subspecialties from oculoplastics to vitreoretinal to neuro-ophthalmology. Anything that you need uh, regarding eye care, um, this is your uh, one-stop shop basically. You're obviously seeing patients who can't afford some of the services that are being offered here in the private sector. What are some of the challenges or dynamics, if I can put it that way, that are involved with patients coming to seek IK here? What are some of the socioeconomic challenges? What are some of the challenges that exist between, I could, I could give you an example as an optometrist, um, 
there's my grandmother delayed having cataract surgery in the early 90s because there was a perception that existed that if you go to the hospital for your eyes you're going to come back worse off than you you were before you went there so in the communities in many parts of the country or continent there's that misconception that people would delay seeking eye health um, solutions because they think that because that other one they think that everyone goes to the a doctor for the same, for the same yes, operation yes, 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 yes. so what are some of those dynamics that because of the socio-economic challenges that exist in the communities because of the um, perceptions or misperceptions mis uh, if i can put it that way that exist regarding eye care what are some of those things that you guys deal with here uh, as ophthalmologists so i must say um and i'll contrast saint john with another um cataract outreach program that we do in Bush Park Ridge, okay. which is at Tinswalo Hospital, okay. which is another um, public hospital, but uh, there's an NGO, um, the Tsemba Foundation, which does a lot of work in that area. And we've actually, with them, uh, they've set up a state-of-the-art cataract center at Tinswalo Hospital. Like, it's got um, everything that you need, basically, for first world cataract center. Okay. Um, so at St. John's, the strange thing is most of our patients actually trust us. Wow. Um, there aren't many misconceptions. If you tell people they need cataract surgery, even the old gogos, they know what cataract surgery is yeah. now. I think because it's been here for so long and a lot of patients have had uh, good outcomes, uh, in the community, especially in Soweto, there's no issues if you come here and you need surgery here. We very rarely uh, come across patients who are afraid to have uh, basics like cataract surgery etc okay um, if it's for example vitreoretinal surgery and when you tell them this is not cataract surgery because now the standard is cataract, cataract. surgery so you've got a retinal detachment and i'm telling you that uh, we have an 80 percent reattachment rate so that means one in five patients will need more than one surgery sure then they start wondering why or if they are severe diabetic with a tractional retinal detachment and you tell them that, you know, there's probably going to be an element of macular ischemia. We'll do the surgery, your vision will improve a bit, but it probably won't get back to 100%. Then that starts throwing them off because um, maybe it's, it's uh, just associating the hospital with cataract surgery and everyone goes for the same procedure <laughs> and my neighbor had a good outcome. But I must say, generally speaking, the best patients I've found uh, um, at St. John in terms of um, always friendly, always uh, understanding. They wait sometimes four hours to see us and never a complaint or very rarely a complaint. Um, in Tin Swallow, however, we do find that a lot of patients are afraid. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, that became even uh, more heightened. Um, I think a lot of patients there were, were probably scared or maybe the kids were scared about the pandemic and going to a hospital. So sometimes we call like 40 patients in for our weekend care okay. and maybe 22 would come, sure. which is just above a 50% and all those 22 we operate like 17, sure. which um, when you're going to do a camp like that uh, isn't ideal. You know, uh, if you call 40, you want 40, 40 so you yeah, get 30 something, and at least you do 30 something cataracts, that's 30 yeah. something families that are helped. Um, but over time, there as well, it's, it's amazing. People, I mean, they talk to each other. So um, the amount of people coming has increased, and people have come who've had surgery who are now bring their sister, you know, and now the sister's coming for surgery. Or they come for their second eye, wow. and they're like happy. And uh, so I think uh, it's as with anything, if something is unknown, um, there were no eye care services beforehand, beforehand in the Gansvalo area. So it was strange because people would just accept that I'm old, now I'm blind, you know? The first patient um, that I operated, um, she was an only eye, she had uh, exfoliation sure. uh, syndrome as well. And the strange thing was, uh, so obviously the surgery was difficult, we did it, it was fine. And she came back a few months later to visit. And the interesting and strange thing that I noticed was that she had put on weight, <laughs> you know? So I, I told her through the translator, you know, Gogo, you're looking nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So she told me no, because now I don't have to wait for people to cook for me. I don't oh. have to wait for people to bring food for wow. me. So when I wake up in the morning, when everyone's gone to work, I can make my own stuff. And sometimes as an IK professional, you don't realize that there's all these other things. We think of you must be able to work and you must be able to function, but sometimes it's just basic. The basic stuff. Yeah. Wow. So, um, yeah, I must say, in terms of patients trusting us, I think as long as a service is designed properly and executed with um, uh, good intention and also good results, then it breeds trust. One thing that I've seen um, in the short time that I've been here is almost every patient is not traveling by themselves. Yes. There's always a family member. And you just mentioned now when you're giving the example, uh, or the explanation that it's the families that you are helping because that one person that you're assisting is going to change how yes. they function within the family dynamics with that comes the explanations like you said it's easy to explain a cataract uh, it's easy to explain a squint and the impact it has on that particular individual but with a lot of other eye conditions it requires it requires more technical explanations and i've seen that with the doctors that are here, we're all different as people. Some are Caucasian, some are black, some are, we're all different, yes. right? Uh, gender is different. Uh, some uh, is a doctor who's been practicing for the last 15 years, yes. but they look like they only came out of university uh, <laughs> yes. last year, yes. and they now have to explain to the gogo yes. that they can't see it. The gogo is thinking to themselves, uh, this is like a little girl telling me that I can't yes. see. So all those uh, communication challenges that exist, how do you guys here at St. John overcome those? Because you mentioned that you've got translators at Temba. And I'm assuming same thing happens here. Yes. And how do the nurses and the ophthalmic assistants and the staff, how do they play a role when it comes to the communication aspect uh, or challenges that may ex exist here? So... St. John um, wouldn't function without any part of the team and obviously our nurses are like gold. Um, <laughs> I always say I, you, very, you will very rarely find better nurses than you find here wow. because you know if you giving eye care we see about 400 to 600 patients a day. <laughs> a day. Yes. A day. So like I said today was a quiet it is a quiet it's a quiet day, day. It's Friday. If, that is, if that's what it's I just saw outside there is, is, is quiet then they are, I can only imagine how it looks like on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah. wow. So we can't function without um, everyone in the team basically. Wow. And our sisters, a lot of them are very experienced and um, the patients trust them. A lot of them have been here, sure, I think before I was born, <laughs> to be honest. Wow, wow. So wow. Um, the patients trust them and also they know how to speak to the patients. So whenever we're explaining technically challenging uh, concepts, etc., that anyone would struggle with, um, the nurses know how to uh, explain it in a way that the patient understands. And also, with the moment someone is speaking to you in a language that you understand, you immediately feel comfortable to ask questions. If okay. I'm talking to you in a language that you don't understand, you're more worried that you're going to not be able to ask the question correctly. Uh, then actually find the information that you want. Wow. So um, the sisters kind of bridge the gap, um, especially for those of us who don't speak uh, any uh, vernacular languages, um, and they bridge the gap quite nicely. Because a lot of the time you'll ask the patient if they understand and you can see, you know, the lady is not understanding 100%, you'll call the sister, and then all of a sudden you'll get like three or four questions. Sure. You know? Sure. Especially when it comes to um, the person that you are counseling is not the patient, and for example, they're the parent, the patient doesn't understand. Then there's always more questions, and rightfully so. Absolutely. Because they feel responsible for their child, and you would feel responsible for the child. So it's, it, it works as a team. From the porters to the sisters to the doctors, everyone fulfills a very vital function and that's why if someone is not fulfilling that function then we will struggle when do you then have time to harness the team so that everyone because i'm 400 plus patients is a lot when do you get the time then or how does how is time allocated for training and development when the show must still continue because um, this is obviously a lot of academic students 
passed through uh, St. John. A lot of the registers come here. Uh, it's an educational uh, institution. institution. Where do you then find the balance between the future IK leaders being trained, the system of what happens from the minute we open our doors in the morning to the time we close, being able to build those relationships amongst the staff because before you can establish trust between the patient and the institution, the staff themselves need to be able to trust one another yes. and make sure that we, you are trusting the nurse, that you know that when the nurse is speaking or the porter is doing something or the driver is doing something, you're all in one accord. So how is the time allocation to harness the skills that make the show go on so efficiently despite the challenges and the dynamics that are involved? How do you guys balance that out? So, to, to say that it happens miraculously by some easy process is not true. <laughs> Time is a problem, especially when you expect it to give so much service delivery, you expect it to train, you expect it to do research, and there's societies to be involved in, etc. We, however, do have um, a regular unit meetings okay. where, for example, uh, the professor, uh, Professor Mayat and Dr. Ali, would meet with the nursing staff. And um, there's various sort of subgroups that work in okay. themselves. Okay. And so there's always interaction between, for example, the doctors and the nurses um, so that we can iron out any problems. A lot of it does happen informally as well. Okay. Which is um, uh, and it's important because sometimes that's, that's the time that you've got. So if a sister um, comes to you and says um, she needs help with this, etc., then sometimes on the job, you actually build that relationship. Okay. Because she's like, when I asked uh, Dr. So-and-so to come and help me, can you help? And for us, it's the same. Okay. If, if you ask a St. John's sister, that, sister, can you help me with something? I guarantee you 100% of the time, they will leave whatever they're doing and they will assist you immediately. Wow, wow. And I think wherever you're watching from, whether you're in ophthalmology or optometry, your team plays a vital component or vital role in the service that you are providing for the community that you are in. So work on establishing a strong team because when the team is strong, you are putting yourself in a better position to be able to add the type of value that will be associated with efficiency, excellence, despite the challenges that you could be faced in. So what you are highlighting is very, very important that sometimes it's not necessarily on the formal structures that you're putting in place, but it's also a lot of the informal stuff that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that adds to that excellence that you're going to be able to do it. I question that I would like to just, okay. sorry. So another example is um, at the Tsemba Foundation, okay. a lot of our sisters come there as well. Ah. So the lovely thing about that is when we've got our sisters from St. John or from Helen Joseph who come through, then we get to spend a lot of after hours time together. Okay. And that uh, makes for a lot of fun, <laughs> but also it's, it's a completely different dynamic if you're with um, your team members out of work. So it's near Kruger, so like we'll go on a, a, a night safari wow. together. Wow. We've seen some amazing stuff. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> so, and it's usually late at night and everyone's tired because we've been operating the last two days and we're completely exhausted, but it's the best time and everyone's excited. And that also helps for you to see the other person as you know, just a human being, you know? Um, and that off time out of work um, does wonders as well. Wow, I love that, I love that. I'm gonna speak from a, the perspective of an optometrist. What I've seen is we have a lot of optometrists in the private sector and very few in the public sector. And sometimes the numbers of people that you have to help in the public sector are three, four times the number of people that you get to actually help in the private sector. And I'm assuming, or I've actually noticed that it's a similar challenge when it comes to ophthalmology, that I take us in John, where you're talking about 400 patients a day, um, and you have to make sure that each and every single one of those patients gets quality IK, gets communicated with in a manner that they can understand, gets after-service protocols that are going to be in place. Being in the public sector, it, for me, I get the sense that 
there's a certain level of care that you have to operate on that is more than what you would have in the private sector. I don't know if I'm, I'm saying it correctly. We always, we always all have to care with what we're doing. But in the public sector, where those people cannot afford some of the services that um, they need, in the public sector, we, how, do you, how do you deal with not being able to help people the way you would want them to be helped because of the dynamics of it being in the public sector? How do you deal with the emotional stress that can be associated with the amount of people that you're finding yourself having to help and then having to take that home? And the remuneration in the private sector is not the same as the remuneration in the public sector. How do you, as Nasir, balance all of that type of challenges or dynamics, if I can put it that way? So I think, you know, at the back of your mind, in, in the private sector, for example, if you, hypothetically speaking, don't want to operate on a patient, the patient can just go to another ophthalmologist. Okay. Here, if you decide that you are not going to operate on a patient in lieu of operating on another patient, um, that's basically um, almost the end of the road for that patient. Sure. And at the end of the day, what you need to think of, and I've got family members that go to uh, public hospitals, um, and you need to keep in mind that if this was my mother, or if this was a family member of mine, how would I like them to be treated? Wow, wow. For example. Wow, I love that. Emotionally, it is draining. I'm glad you touched on that. It is, um, you know, to, to tell someone that, um, Unfortunately, we have to postpone your surgery for another three months or so, or another month, because of uh, various factors, we had an emergency come in, etc. That um, emotionally it becomes quite draining. And the socioeconomic circumstances of patients not only don't allow them sometimes to seek healthcare from elsewhere, but you need to understand that the patient has probably gotten up at four or half past three in the morning, has paid to take three taxis to get here, to get here, or sometimes two taxis to a, a hospital in another province to get there at six, so that the hospital transport could get here at eight. Oh. And you're basically telling that patient that you're going to have to repeat it the next time. Oh. And if there's another emergency, um, you not you may not get your surgery again. And it it it's a constant juggling act because if someone presents with an acute problem that if you act now, you'll be able to restore and save vision versus, for example, a routine cataract surgery. You're always going to take the acute problem over that. So emotionally, it is quite draining, but I think everyone is doing the best that they can. Um, and as long as when you lay down uh, on your bed at night, you can think, I, I haven't been able to give complete care to everyone, but I've done the best for everyone that I could under the circumstances, then it sort of helps you deal with the emotional um, aspect of not being able to operate like in private, for example. Anyone comes in, by tomorrow or next week, your surgery can be done. Wow. I've seen you walk through the corridors uh, of St. John. You, 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 you come across as someone who genuinely cares about your team, your people, your colleagues, the patients. Have you always been like that? What, is, what have you done in your career to not only fine tune your clinical skills, but also to fine tune your leadership skills uh, that enables you to be what I saw when I came here, where I see you walk through the corridors and you're calling people by name. You're acknowledging the people. You, there's a, there's a certain sense of you want to be here that comes across very strongly. And a lot of people don't necessarily get to be in the profession long enough to still 10 years later, five years later, 15 years later, to still have that sense of passion, urgency, commitment uh, for the profession. What have you done to harness that? Or I can even take it a step further. How did your love for the eyes, because I did not ask you that question in the beginning, how did your love for the eyes lead you to becoming an ophthalmologist? Okay, so... <laughs> it's a mouthful. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot to do in one go. 
I'm, firstly, I think you should probably ask my colleagues if, <laughs> <laughs> and not just go on on what you what you see. But um, I think you know, at some level, you need to understand that if there's that old story about um, uh, people in a village being asked to contribute uh, milk. Mm-hmm. For, so that they could ration it. I don't know if you've ever I've never heard of this it. random <laughs> that comes to mind. But every household was asked to contribute a pitcher of milk. Okay. And uh, certain people. That you can get it. We guys, um, just so you know, we're doing this at the hospital, so there will be interruptions. Please don't mind them. Uh, the show must continue. And uh, Dr. Ali, like you heard, there's like 400 patients that the hospital gets to see. So if we are going to be interrupted, we're not going to edit this. I just want you to see that sometimes, as a professional, you have to take into consideration that you have to build your brand, build your clinical competency skills, build your team, build your practice, and all of that, unfortunately, or fortunately, has to happen as we go along. So don't always think yourself that you're putting yourself in just this one box and not allocating yourself enough time to do all other things that are important that can actually help you in your IK journey or practice that you are in. Yeah, yes, Dr. Um, so, getting back to the story. Yeah, you were um, saying that each household would need to contribute a, 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 a jug or a pitcher of milk yes. so that the, the village could, could ration. And people thought, you know, if I just put in water, no one's going to notice. <laughs> and the next day, when they looked, it was just water. Wow. No one had contributed more. Wow. So my point is that on some level, there are what about 60 million people in South Africa. How many of those people have medical aid or can afford private practice? Sure. I would say conservative estimate less than 10%. Correct. So we're talking about less than 6 million. Correct. There is <laughs> no ways that 54 million people can be serviced by the minority of eye care professionals. And if you ask the question of it, then why should I do it? Then I would question why do you do eye care then? I'm not saying don't uh, be financially well off. I'm not saying don't do uh, private practice, etc. But just on a pragmatic and practical point of view, how are 54 million people going to be serviced wow. by 60 or 70 ophthalmologists? Wow. <laughs> it's impossible wow. and that's why the, the, the amount of cataracts waiting for surgery is extremely high. Um, the amount of uh, people just waiting for eye care in general is a simple thing like spectacles. Patients in the state uh, um, sector don't uh, have ready access to that. Absolutely correct. And you need to think on, on a personal level, and everyone needs to do their own introspection, is that what do I need to do to try and help? And if I do my bit, and um, that's what I can offer, and even if it be for five years or 10 years, and then you decide I want to go to private practice, that's fine. If you're able to do it your whole life, um, like the professors and the senior consultants here, that's amazing. Wow. We've got um, three props in our department, Professor Carmichael, McLaren, and Professor Mayer, all of them dedicated their lives to, to eye care in the state sector. Wow. So I think it's, it's personal for everyone, and I completely understand some people, um, they, they wouldn't um, be able to function well in a, in a setting that's so resource constrained. But at the end of the day, the problem is 54 million patients, conservative estimate, and how many ophthalmologists and optometrists and ophthalmic wow. assistants are there to service that? And when you just look at the numbers, um, the government alone isn't going to be enough to sort that out. You need actual South Africans on the ground who look at the problem, see there's a problem, and say, okay, this is what we can do. Wow. So like when we go for weekend cataract blitz or when we're operating here, you think of it in terms of families being help, helped. Because mm. like uh, we're going back to the gogo, her grandchild no longer needs to look after her. If the grandchild no longer needs to look after her, the grandchild can now go to school, school. and concentrate only on school. school. I don't have to come home and cook. Gogo sorted herself out. 
I can study, I can get better grades. In five years time, I can matriculate with a better matric. Wow. That will enable me to get financial funding. Wow. I can get a degree. In one, um, obviously other contributing factors, but one act changes the trajectory of an entire family, family. and wow. hopefully generations to come. Wow. And sometimes that's what you need to think, you know, it's, if I pour a little water on the soil, I may not see the plants grow and I'll move on somewhere else, but it is growing. Wow, once you're so done, powerful. it is growing. <laughs> wow, Dr. Glover actually always says that you need to know what your why is. Uh, you need to be clear on your why yeah. because that's going to keep you on solid ground. And when you then attach your belief system into your why, you, it's, not, it's no longer just a job because you put your heart into everything that you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it means people get to see your heart. And when they get to see your heart, it means they're going to experience what you're providing them as a service completely differently. And that's, so, that's such a powerful lesson that you've taught us. You are not one-dimensional when it comes to your role as an ophthalmologist. You have obviously been involved with research. Yes. You have constantly been um, fine-tuning your academic profile so that your clinical skills can be able to operate at a completely different level. Can you please just give us a, a breakdown of your academic journey, if you don't mind? And I know recently I have to read this because uh, this is so important. I have to read this. This is so... You can to make me embarrassed. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, you, said, you, you wrote here on your LinkedIn page uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, we finally got to travel to the UK to receive the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Medal from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, which is in Scotland. Uh, this was after graduating top of the class in my master's degree in clinical ophthalmology uh, at the University of Edinburgh. You go on further and say the we in inverted commas here, above is because things like this don't happen in isolation. Uh, you were thankful to the Almighty, uh, your wife, Sarah uh, Ishmael, who is also an ophthalmologist, uh, your daughter, your parents, your brother, your family for the support throughout the time. You go on further to give a big shout out to Dr. Hassan Ali, uh, who supervised your master's research, uh, to the professors uh, uh, Balian and Dillion and uh, Professor Rajni Sanders for running like a wonderful and uh, enlightening program. You, the list goes on of the, the gratitude that you showed with regards to the achievement that you were at, uh, uh, attained and the journey to what led here. Can you please unpack that for us? You know why that's so important? There's a final year ophthalmology student who is frustrated and just can't wait to finish and they have perhaps lost their sense of why. They have perhaps just want to get through this course and they don't have that love that they started with. Perhaps it's an ophthalmologist or optometrist who has been in the industry for 15 years and they're no longer doing things at the level of excellence that they were doing with seven years ago. So stories like this inspire people on a completely different level because they can relate with you because it's not always easy starting a family, yes. going, building <laughs> this uh, career, it comes with a price. It comes with a lot of sacrifice. Do you mind just unpacking that journey for us? Because I'm quite certain that so many people watching this are going to benefit from just hearing how it started, the journey along the way, and where it is right now. Sure. So unpacking this is gonna be. <laughs> you're really asking with difficult. No, it's, yeah, this is this is this this is why we do this is because we're here to learn from one another. Yes. And you 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 function within so many roles that it will, will be it will be an injustice if we don't unpack this actually. So we we're gonna go back to quite far back actually, Fine. but um. Ophthalmology in South Africa, to me, the way I saw it was when I was specializing, you had two choices. You did uh, private sector or you did state sector. Private was the vast majority. Okay. And state was um, 
kind of uh, a minority of people and sometimes they, they are there for various reasons. And you kind of think that there must be more to this. Like it cannot just be that um, you're in the state sector and you're trying your best to service a multitude of patients or you're in the private sector and you're very comfortable and sometimes you're there because there wasn't a post or sometimes you're there because uh, financially it's, it's more lucrative. And so it's amazing how many people along the way um, influence you. So for example, my, my dad always um, impressed upon us that, you know, if you do anything, you do it with integrity and you do it to the best of your ability. Okay. And when I think back, back in the day when, when he was growing up, for example, he never had the opportunities that I had. Like my dad never um, got to finish school. And that was because of uh, whatever the circumstances were back then. But he always impressed upon us that what you do, you do to the best of your ability um, and you do it with integrity. So that's what, that was how we, we started out. And with ophthalmology, coming to Wits was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, from the props to the consultants, Dr. Hassan Ali just knocked on the door <laughs> into you now. <laughs> But um, he was actually the reason why I started ophthalmology wow. because um, he's an ophthalmologist and he was like, you know, um, as a student, you don't really get exposed to it. And he's like, get exposed to it, see if you like it. Um, you really can have an impact on patients, but it also offers you quality of life for your family so that you're not living in the hospital. And that's, I think, how the balance, wow. you help keep the balance as well. So um, I got into ophthalmology, uh, the consultants and the props that were here. Obviously, there were those who, who weren't exactly the greatest, but you learn from everyone. Sometimes Absolutely. you learn what not to do. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And that lesson is just as important as someone who you look up to. Absolutely. So you I learn agree with from that. the bad and the good. <laughs> and some things I, I landed uh, into by chance. So, for example, I, I presented at the first sex uh, that I, I attended. What is sex for someone who's in uh, Zambia? It's the South African Glaucoma Society Congress. Um, and I, I uh, won first prize there. Wow. And I wasn't even intending to go to that sex. But it's <laughs> another <laughs> long story. story of how I got there. And then that enabled me to go to the European Glaucoma Society uh, residence course. So then I met other European residents and then you talk. So there's exchange of ideas and it's like, you know, in South Africa, we think that our training isn't as good as there. And you come to realize that we really get good training here. I mean, in terms of our um, surgical training, etc., I would say we are among the best in the world. And I'm, I'm not just saying oh. that because we see the full spectrum. And that's what I've noticed in the US and Europe. They see mainly the, the softer, earlier cataracts that are easily phacoemulsifiable. We see the full range. The rest of Africa, phacoemulsification hasn't reached some areas. In wow. some countries, there are no centers where you can get phacoemulsification. So being in the AOC, the African Ophthalmology Council, showed me the other side of that. And you realize that in South Africa, we are perfectly poised to get the complete balance. So we're able to do the soft private cataracts and put in a toric IOL or a premium uh, IOL, but we've got the dense cataracts wow. where you need to use either different techniques in fake emulsification or you need to do an extra capsular cataract wow. extraction. So at the EGS, I was like, the, the, the registrars there didn't want to believe me. They were like, how many fakeos have you done? I'm like, 50. <laughs> and you're at the start of your second year, you're lying. I'm like, I'm not lying. <laughs> Like that's the training wow. in South Africa. Wow. And the guy's like, I'm in my third year, I'm still making incisions. Wow. And you're like, okay. So then I was like, okay, that, that was very interesting. And I always believe traveling and seeing things opens up your mind. So the fact that you see how other health systems function, how other registrars are trained, etc. cetera. Um, and so then um, academics has always been an interest of mine, but then I found an avenue. So I presented at a lot of subsequent uh, congresses, and I was fortunate enough to win uh, a few more prizes, etc. And then I got, um, I did my uh, master's uh, here at Fitz, and I was like, you know, I, I really struggle with research because um, there isn't a lot of uh, backup because you, you're working and you're expected to do clinical work yet 
still provide, uh, still do research and, and no one taught me how to do research. So then um, I, I designed a study where we were going to look at uh, intravitreal avastin okay. for our diabetic patients. And that's another thing about research. Sorry, I'm going on no, no, no. tangents here. It's, 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 but you're actually breaking it down very nicely, yeah. step by step. Nicely. But um, we try and do research here that would benefit our patients. Okay. Like we, we uh, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but we're tired of reading what American patients works for them and what European patients works for and them. And trying to implement it here. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't sometimes, it's completely non applicable you know? Um, so I designed a study and then during that I was like, designed the study but I'm, I'm there's certain things I'm not certain of and um, I found this program at Harvard Medical School uh, it's called the Graduate Clinical Scholars Research Training Program and that uh, looked like a good program to teach you it's a one-year program uh, through Harvard where you learn how to do research okay um, and obviously financially the dollar is a lot stronger so it's quite taxing but I was like uh, with the support of my wife she was like go for it and she's just started hers now oh, no. wow um and i went for it and that was um life-changing because then there was always this thing that from south africa or africa we cannot publish because they don't want to know what we're doing wow so there is some element of uh of that to deny it completely would be wrong and to say that that's the case all the time would also be wrong and I found that, you know, if you do the research correctly, you will find a journal or an editor somewhere who will recognize that you've done wow. it correctly. And that's when basically uh, things just took off. Sure. Because with all the data that we've had, we were then able to design studies correctly, analyze them correctly, and then get them into big top tier international journals wow. because um, why would you not want to know what's happening here it doesn't mean that it's um, from Africa that you are not going to get a man from Ghana in your practice in the US yeah <laughs> so and you need to know what is applicable to this man from absolutely Ghana. so I did that course and then I was like okay and then that um, changed things for me and for us in terms of research because now we, we get into these uh, journals and then on the flip side what happens is the journal looks and they see okay from St. John we've got this publication these are the authors and then the journal writes back to you and they say we have another article uh, in a um, sphere of uh, your expertise in the field of your expertise would you review this article wow. us? so wow. then that begins to strengthen um, the relationship where now it's not as you in South Africa that you're not publishing. You are publishing and they are asking you to review their research. Their research from our side. Yes. Wow. So recently, I mean, it was, it was I, I thought to myself and I was just chuckling. There's a very famous ophthalmologist and I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, he's known worldwide. And I recently reviewed a paper by him. Wow. And I was, there and I was like, do, do they know why? Like, oh, what, are they, what are they thinking? Wow. You know? Wow. But the point is that if you go out and if you acquire the skills and to a specific standard, um, you know, life in the world, they don't really care who you are as long as you can produce. And if you can produce, you'll be given the chance. Um, wow. I love it. In terms of research in South Africa, I think this ophthalmology research is almost non-existent. Sure. And uh, a few of the viewers might might dispute what I'm saying, but um, we need to put out more research and we need to put out more African-based research. A lot of people, unfortunately, I think, are, um, I wouldn't say, I would say under an incorrect impression that what Europe does or what the US does is what we should be doing. And it's sometimes seen as the gold standard yes. for everything else yes. and that's not necessarily yes. the case. So for example, um, my wife uh, Sarah's masters, we showed um, unequivocally that our black African patients have a thicker retinal nerve fiber layer than the European database which means the machine is missing the glaucoma. Wow. And clinically we see it, but now the, the standard that you've got is... It's from elsewhere, yes. yes. So you you miss out on so many yes. 
patients. Uh, and, wow. And, and that's a problem. So we, we um, published the article. That article has subsequently been cited in the British Journal of Ophthalmology and uh, another journal from the US, um, which is an AVO journal. Um, and your viewers would know AVO is a very yeah. uh, well-respected organization. And the point is that um, when you look at the literature, there's people from KwaZulu-Natal who have published on the same, Nigeria has published on the same, yet we don't have an African database. Wow. And it boggles your mind <laughs> that we are showing you that it's different and we need this to help uh, care for our patients. So that comes back to what I'm saying in terms of um, we do research that directly impacts our patients. Like We're not uh, worried about if you tell me you've got, uh, we want to develop a new molecule, etc. I'm happy to do that as well. But that's not our primary focus. Like our like focus that. is our patients. So that was um, my, my journey at Harvard. Um, that subsequently came to an end. And I still have um, links with them. So with classmates, etc. Sometimes they in other specialities, they um, ask for collaboration and help with their projects, that's fine. Then I thought that, um, okay, so I've got the South African qualification, but um, around the world, firstly, I don't know how that measures up. So I know surgically, we, we taught well. I don't know academically and theoretically we how you well are we taught, up, yeah. firstly. And secondly, is that uh, for various reasons, unfortunately, our qualifications are not as recognized as they should be. So then I was like, okay, um, I need to do an overseas uh, program to see like what was my Where question, etc. Yeah. And I enrolled in this master's at the University of Edinburgh. So um, the Harvard program was uh, distance learning, but with live uh, lectures and tutorials where you could interact and ask questions, thanks to um, technology. Um, but you had to spend three weeks over that side okay. of their faculty, which was really nice. The Edinburgh was uh, completely online, but again with live uh, interactions, etc., which helped a lot. Um, and then you find that our teaching here is excellent. It's world class because you are able to hold your own within a class from all over the world, basically. Europe uh, and uh, South America, Asia, everywhere included. Wow. And you're like, okay, so I've been taught correctly. Then there was a research component. So there was um, a theory component with exams, we wrote exams, there was a research component as well. And then you find that we've, we're sitting on a gold mine here. Sure. But the problem is it's, it's perception, you know? That if you if you can imprison someone in their own mind, I'm getting philosophical, <laughs> right now, but if you can imprison someone in their own mind, then you've won. And I feel like uh, sometimes ophthalmology in South Africa and eye care in South Africa is too busy watching what is happening in the world in the world, and not actually looking at what's happening here. Wow. And we can do a lot here. Wow. And there's a lot that we actually have to offer the world. Wow, so, um, like so you have not even started the work, basically. We've got so much to do. Yes. We have not yeah. scratched the surface of what's surface. actually possible Definitely. from here, from Definitely. South Africa, from the continent of Africa. 100%. We literally have not scratched the surface Definitely. because imagine if m more of us can be able to then say, wait a minute, what can we birth from yes. our continent exactly. that will influence the rest of the world? Exactly. Uh, it can change so much of the IK landscape and not only in IK but just healthcare as a whole can change because it's not limited to IK. Yeah and, and that's exactly it is that there are so few so there's the majority are in private sector there are few in government sector doing research is even less and a lot of people will tell you I, I'm not a researcher I'm just a clinician and I actually don't believe that because um, if you're getting a routine cataract surgery, for example, you will definitely be able to do it. No issues asked. But if you have a patient that's outside of the norm, the norm. Mm -hmm. then you need to be able to go to the literature and you need to be able to decide because you'll get one study that says do this and another study that will say do that. And you yourself need to decide that what is the strongest evidence that I have to perform this procedure on my patient and am I comfortable with it even if 
the complications are listed as such. Wow. So then you're not also doubting yourself. Did I do the right thing? Or if I did the other procedure, would it have yeah. been better? You now know. Yes. Wow. So I don't believe in, in, in just being a clinician. You can never just be a clinician. You, your job is also uh, as a gatekeeper of knowledge. And therefore, what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to look at the literature, see what it says, and then implement that for the best of your patients. Wow. <laughs> I hope wow. I answered the question. Wow, you did more than answer. <laughs> uh, we need to run a webinar series with you. Uh, that's the only <laughs> um, research webinar. Uh, so he's not agreeing now, because now if he agrees now, you know, but we're going to work on him. Don't worry, everyone. We're going to work on him. Um, and I know the right person who will be able to get him on board with regards um, getting him to do a webinar series uh, with us. If you on... go through my wife, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, that's the person, uh, Dr. Ishmael, we're going to go through her. And we know that when we go through her, she will get us the information that we need and how we must approach him because my oh my, what, a, what an interview. Um, you unpacked so many aspects of, 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 of IK, of somatology, and the value that we add to changing people's lives. Where can people connect with you? I know you mentioned the AOC. We will do a, 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 the African Ophthalmology Council, correct? Yes. We will do a, a profile of, of that uh, very, very soon. But in terms of today, where can people connect online with uh, the AOC? Is there anything that's happening very soon yes. that people can be able to go to the website? Uh, what event is happening sure. very soon, if you don't mind doing that? So, um, just for your viewers, the AOC is the African Ophthalmology Council, like you said. It's the first um, supranational, uh, sub-Saharan continental African ophthalmology uh, body. Wow. So it aims to be really big. It's quite young um, and quite new as well. Um, what it aims to do is to bring, uh, like we've been speaking, ophthalmologists from every single country in Sub-Saharan Africa, because let's face it, we say we're facing the same problems, and to allow for skills transfer as well as transfer of ideas. Okay. So if something has worked in Zambia, for example, um, whether in a city or in a rural area, it's more likely that that's applicable to us than something in London, <laughs> for example. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and we, the AOC, you can find them on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and Twitter. You can also, um, we have a Young Ophthalmologists uh, Working Committee where you, we do a quarterly webinar series. Um, it's usually advertised on the Facebook and LinkedIn pages. Um, and then uh, we have our second annual Congress. So wow. we had our first, uh, first one last year. It was a virtual Congress. We were actually hoping that this one would be an in person, person. But it will still be virtual again this year. It will be virtual again okay. this year. Um, the timing with COVID and stuff, we were just too unsure. Okay. So uh, it will be a virtual Congress. It's taking place at the end of October, so the last uh, weekend of October, the 28th and 29th. Okay. Um, just double check the dates. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> we're going to also, when we uh, publish this, we'll put the, the links that's on the comment section as well okay. to share the pages, the social media pages, so that everyone can connect with it. And Africa Media is here to help yes. with regards a sharing of information because for us is if all of us can be for Africa, we're gonna elevate the, the the IK industry to a whole nother level where things are gonna be birthed from here. Even with iAfrica Media, we didn't want to be influenced by external things. We wanted to hey, let's speak as ophthalmologists and yes. optometrists yes. from the continent. Uh, let's showcase what's happening in IK. Uh, in the continent or on the continent. So, wow, wow. We're grateful for you. Uh, we're super, super grateful for you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the sacrifices that you do. Um, it's not easy uh, going through the process of what you have highlighted today. Uh, having a family, being a leader, being involved in so many elements, but someone has to do it because the need is that big. Yeah. So thank you very much for the sacrifices. 
And this will be the first of many interviews that we're going to be doing through you because at the end of the day, the work is a lot. Yes. And the work is a lot. Everyone, if you're not yet subscribed to the African Media YouTube channel, do so right now. Uh, all the links that Dr. Nasir mentioned, we're going to put them in the comment section as well. We're going to share it on our Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram page as well as our website as well. So make sure you stay connected until the next episode. Make sure that you constantly go out of your way to add as much value as you possibly can to each and every single person that walks through your practice. Because like Dr. Abby said, you're not just changing that one person's life. You're changing an entire family. So always keep that at the back of your mind that when that patient is sitting across from you, you're impacting beyond their life alone. It's the entire family that you're changing. So stay connected, everyone. Until the next episode.